Jody. Okay, welcome everybody to the Annapolis Valley Investor Meetup, May 1st. My birthday is in 20 days, in case you want to know. Go to ABBA. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. I'm 49. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking to Paul McGinnis. Uh, but before we get into talking to Paul, we're going to put him on the hot seat. He's bought and sold a lot of real estate and has done a lot of different things. Um, but before that, I'm going to do uh, a little bit of a market update. That's going to be done by the Benedict Group. I will do, actually, I'm going to do the, mar uh, the mortgage update first, then we'll do the Benedict Group update, and then we're going to welcome Paul to the hot seat. So um, I actually did a presentation tonight. Imagine, I've been doing this for how long and I haven't put one up yet, so I'm uh, kind of proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, many guys, I don't know if you know me or not, these guys are new. Um, Jackie Hart. Oh, well, Jackie Hart, know. yes. You okay. wouldn't know my name, but you would know her. I know Jackie Hart's name. Um, so, I'm a mortgage broker, I work in Dartmouth, I live here in Windsor, we do this uh, investor meetup and we record it because there are tons of people that come to this. But it's not always on a night that everybody can make, so we record it so that people can actually uh, watch it and get the content. There's tons of content back down on the page if you ever want to go check that out. My details are above. So what I'm doing from now on, I'm going to be giving you guys uh, updates on rates, fixed rates, variable rates, inflation update, and trends that we're seeing in the industry. So with regard to fixed rates, we're down to 5.4.54. We even have a 4.44. Um, on a five-year fixed, I still won't sell a five-year fixed. I would still prefer my clients go into a variable or we are looking now at three-year fixed rates because why would I lock you into 4.54 for five years when I can have the opportunity potentially to, to improve on that rate in two to three years from now? Does my commission get cut? Absolutely it does. There's lots of brokers still doing the five-year, but I think in a lot of instances, three years is fitting people a lot better. Variable rates, so the Bank of Canada held the key overnight interest rate the last time that they did it, and they've held it twice now. We don't know what he's gonna do next go around, but the inflation has come down in Canada, so it's, do, it's doing what it was meant to do. Are we gonna drive us into a depression? Recession? I don't know, I'm not even gonna speculate on that, but it's doing what it, meant, what it was meant to do. Something that I learned in my conference last week is that so they're driving the key interest rate up and when they were doing that with the variable rate mortgages the variable rate the payments on those mortgages were adding to the inflation so it was kind of they were putting rates up but it was still adding to the inflation so anyway we, we're starting to see it come down um trends that we're seeing like it, again i'll let you know that people are less likely to take a variable rate mortgage now I am cautioning people not to take the lowest five-year fixed rate because that can often shackle you to a lender for longer than what you want. Um, penalties will be extremely high on those to get out. So we are seeing a lot more three-year fixed rates going out the door versus the five. So this is the lending that you have available to you and most people don't know what's possible when it comes to lending, but the big five banks, so I will say BMO, Amanda's now working for BMO. So there's BMO, TD, Scotiabank, um, CIBC, the big five, the ones that you grew up with opening your bank accounts with. There are monoline lenders. Monoline lenders actually lend the bonds from the big five. So as an example, um, First National lends the bonds from RBC. Okay, that's a lot of where their money comes from. So monoline lenders lend that way. There's alternative lenders. So alternative lenders are it's, it's what I would call commercial residential lending. It's very common sense lending. If the building can support itself with the rent, usually the deal will work. Will you pay more money for it? Absolutely you will. But we're also not gonna ask for your tax returns. We're just gonna make sure that you have an affordability factor. Then there's private lending. So private lending, there's a few companies around. I will put it out there that I am incorporating a private lending company here in the next eight months. It's in the works, it's underway. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be a MIC or if it's gonna be peer-to-peer -peer or if it's gonna be a, a bit of both, but uh, working on that. Um, and then there's also peer-to-peer -peer lending. So peer-to-peer -peer lending came to me through Scott McGilvery. Um, he runs a company out of Ontario, he's on HGTV, and they lend each other money. And when I sort of figured out what they were doing, I started doing that for my clients and 
it's been working very well. People have been making money, and I have other clients that have been able to get into homes as a result of it. Commercial, so I don't do commercial lending at all. Um, I have people that do that. There, we have a person in our office that does it, but commercial lending in itself, you need an expert. It's like a build, it's like any different products. You wanna make sure that you're dealing with a specialist that knows what they're doing. I don't know what I'm doing, I'm not gonna do your deal. So, that's it for me, but basically, anytime you wanna start your wealth building, and you want to include real estate in your wealth building, get in touch with your broker, get yourself educated, and then move forward on your real estate journey. So that's my information. So next up, I'm gonna, I think I have you already in here, is the Benedict Group. So you're just gonna hit the down arrow. So Mark Mayer is standing in for Jonathan Benedict, and they're gonna let us know about the trends in the market in our area, geographically. Sit down. All right, so I'm Mark Marin. Um, with Benedict Group, as Leanne just said. For the Valley, year over year, what we're finding is we're getting more inventory come to market, um, much more than last year and leaps and bounds over uh, 2020, 2021. Um, what else we're seeing is we're at about 30 to 35 days on market at this point. From the time that you list until the time that it's a firm done deal with all your inspections that are done, you can sign papers and you know that you've sold your property. Um, that being said, we don't have as many sales because there's more inventory, there's fewer buyers coming in. Um, we don't see the big push coming from Ontario that we did over the past couple of years. It is slowing down. All of that aside, we're still up. Our year over year, we're about 7% right now over last year. It's not the cleanest. Um, we're sitting at about 341 for average price over last year's 316. So the prices are still going up, even though there's more inventory, there's fewer buyers, there's more for sale. It's going <coughs> closer to a uh, balanced market than, used, than it was over the past couple of years. This I didn't, know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It didn't come across nice. No. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, this is exactly what I was just saying. The listings are going down, um, the sales are going down, inventory is climbing back to balanced, um, and our days on market, actually it's showing 25. So at one point over the past few weeks, I saw it as high as about 30, 32. Um, for the V1 area, which is Mount Union Active Transport, Scott, it's 360 and over 330 from last year. And we're still priced. Yeah. So, and then um, 253 was 2021. So, I mean, we have jumped and we're still climbing. Again, it's the same, we're seeing the same thing, Hans Porter to Aylesford. Now, for V1, we were averaging, I think it was 7.4 or 7.5% year over year sale price increase. The V2, the Hans Porter to Aylesford, which is where you're gonna find the hotter markets that have been hotter for the past couple of years, where you have Wolfville, Kentville, Berwick, um, has been slowing down. So that's sitting at about a 6% increase in average sale price year over year. And yeah, so I mean, it's, it's coming back to balance, but we're still up in price. Things are just taking a little bit longer to sell. So. And I would say as well mm -hmm. that we're not even close to being balanced. No. We're like 1,300, we need 3,300, we need 2,000 more homes. Yeah. So we're the good news story in the whole country. Yeah. We're the rest sitting of the country's down and we're not. Yeah. We're about a month and a half of inventory. Where the past two years we've been two four weeks, months. three weeks. Yes. But before that, before it's four, four or five, five months. Yeah. 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 yeah, we're still <laughs> better off than anywhere else in the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're still getting the prices that we were looking at and we're still seeing some competition. Um, I've been in competition multiple times over the past couple weeks where we've had four, five, six offers in hand on properties. It just, it all depends on where the property is and how it was priced. So as long as that's still there, the buyers are still hungry. Does anybody have any questions? Questions? 
Thank you, Mark. That was lovely. All right, so next up, we're going to get Paul into the hot seat. And we, so Laura is our event planner, and she's the one that sort of plans these ahead of time. And she created this that it's the interview series. So we're interviewing people that come to this group about their journey because everybody can learn something from someone else. I know there was a woman that sat in this room and last month we had a lady who said that she interviews a dog <coughs> and she got up here and she said, you know, when they come into the house, I'm like, yeah, bring the dog. And then she makes them leave the dog in a room and they walk out and the dog starts barking like crazy or acts like an asshole. She, okay, what's going on with your dog or whatever, right? You don't want that when they're in a building with three other units, mm -hmm. but she accepts dogs. She just needs to see them. So. I have another investor that's doing that exact same thing. She's actually interviewing dogs over Zoom now. So <laughs> just, just a tip, right? You know, just she had learned something. So um, I'm going to read Laura's introduction, and I'll add a as well. Uh, Paul's been a group member of this group since 2022. Um, he will take on my questions, sharing insight, allowing us to learn how he's handled being an invest on the investor adventure, because it's been an adventure. As an entrepreneur by nature, he got started in real estate investing in 2005. Creative financing has always been a passion of his and he secured properties in a number of different ways. He's always keen to connect with other like-minded people to continue to learn with others. So, Paul, if you'd like to come up. I, I don't have any questions scripted. <laughs> I'm gonna, it's okay now. But I'm gonna put you, <laughs> I, I'm gonna put you in, in, in the hot seat. You got a beer and I don't have a wine, that's not fair, okay. So, Paul, I remember a time seven, eight years ago, and you had purchased, I think you had five, maybe six properties at the time, and you had hit a wall at a bank. Mm -hmm. And you got in touch with me, mm -hmm. and then we, we grew you, and then you outgrew me, and then you proceeded on. Back when you started out <coughs> real estate investing, um, tell us how you got your first investment property. And one of the big barriers that people have, of course, is cash. Mm -hmm. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with us how you acquired, because I wasn't part of this journey, yeah. how you acquired your first six properties. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the first property that I purchased was a four unit property. Um, I was pretty young. I was probably 23-ish, 24 maybe. Um, Pay attention. And I had, I had just gotten a salary job um, here in town, and I was fortunate where I, it was at the boarding school here when I lived there, so I didn't have a lot of expenses, and I figured I should be doing something with my money um, that I was now making instead of... Not drinking know. beer on the weekend? <laughs> yeah, well, I did that too. But, um, <laughs> so one of my colleagues was selling up this property. So I purchased the property. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Uh, learned many a hard lesson on that property. And it was the only property I owned for probably five, maybe even six more years um, before I got another property. Um, and, and the second property I got, so that, sorry, that what first- What was the hard, what, okay, let me get you to back up. Yeah. What were the mistakes you made? <laughs> True, like it's so. So, honestly, the biggest mistake was was learning. It was a rental that needed some love. It needed some work. It had it cash. Um, needed some cash, which I didn't necessarily have. It was uh, a group of tenants who didn't always get along. Uh, one tenant had a restraining order on another tenant. Um, Okay. Which kind of speaks to the overall uh, aura, let's say, of yeah. that particular property. So learning how to navigate people um, is really where most of the lessons were learned. I got burned mm, at least three, four times fairly significantly on that property with uh, being too nice and, and not following, you know, the, the professional uh, way in which real estate investing has to be. Uh, has to be handled because it is a business at the end of the day at the time I didn't treat it as such and therefore uh, I, I learned some painful financial lessons okay all right so tell us about the next one that you acquired after that so next one was uh, a joint venture with my parents who didn't live here they lived in Ontario um, bought a duplex 
that uh, was, I, I believe, it, it was on the market, but someone had passed away, and, and, and so it was just sort of sitting there. It was far from the days, you know, that Mark was just talking about. There was many, many months of inventory, so this, this had sat there for, for a while. We got it for uh, a really good price. I want to say it was about 100000 right around there, duplex. Needed work, we completely redid one side, um, and the other side we, you know, upgraded sufficiently. So when you say we, do you mean that you and your wife went in and tore out floors, or do you mean you hired people, or did you borrow money? Tell us about that. Yeah, so the I guess the, the partnership with my, with my parents on that one was, you know, we kind of split the down payment, um, and then split the renovation costs short term, which, we hired out, it was a family member actually, who came from Ontario, lived in the place, and renovated the property um, at the same time. Was that Adrian? No. Okay. No, no, it was another guy who hasn't been back since. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> another lesson. Um, and then what we did with that one is refinance it, kind of pulled up some of that initial uh, equity. equity, paid everybody back. And it's been uh, an outstanding rental, you know, to this day. One side, so that was, I want to say that was 2014 when we purchased that. One tenant's still there, the very first tenant, so it's never changed. Um, and the other side of that duplex is only on its second tenant. So, wow. Yeah. wow. Yeah, so very, very... Good and are tenants. you now with the new rent caps? Are you now automatically doing the two percent per year? I know a lot of a lot of landlords didn't because they could, and now that they can't, they're actually raising the rent by two percent because they may not be able to get more down the road when their taxes go up, their rates go up. Yep, hundred percent. So I was very much of that mind, you know, before you know before the pandemic existed. Um, they were great tenants, and it was you know that. The, the flip side of the coin of, well, I'd rather have people I know and trust in there than raise the rent and risk losing them. Um, but as we learned in, in 2020 and it's rent caps, you know, it is it is a business. So, yeah, the 2% has to be implemented, um, you know, and then I guess five in, in January. Did you start doing that just when the rent thing came out or where did you have that in place before that started? Didn't have it in place um, probably as regularly as I should. Yep, like most. Yeah, like most people, um, but it had been sort of increased okay. over, over time, which was good. Okay, so then so then you got another one after that. So did you refi this property and get to the, <clears throat> the next one? Where did you get the down payment for the next one? So the next one was a bit of a interesting situation where another colleague of mine was selling another uh, rental property uh, a little further down in the valley and partnered up with uh, another, a different family member, the uh, fa father-in-law this time. Uh, <coughs> so he was money guy and I was everything else guy uh, and made that one work for a little while, which I then, I have sold, since sold that one. Um, but soon after that, my original four unit property actually burned down. And is that the one in Windsor? Yes, yes. So no one was hurt, thankfully. Uh, but I was in the process of trying to finance four of those properties to get you more down payment, right? Mm, that sounds familiar, but I don't quite remember the timeline on that. I don't? Because yeah. I think I like so. Paul came to me. He had maxed out the number of properties he could buy with RBC. And it was so funny because we met, we met at Tim Hortons. I was traveling around to see people at that time. And he was just like, I fucking love real estate. <laughs> and, and, and he would text me that on a Friday night and I would answer his question. He's like, I love real estate. Um, and you were sort of at an impasse of being able to buy more property. And what we did was is we looked at the properties that he had. So I'll, I'll just use this as round numbers. So, so let's just say he had four properties and they were each worth 250000 and he owed two hundred on all four. There was still fifty one fifty two. Mm -hmm. So it was two hundred thousand across all four properties. So I had a lender lined up to get you a hundred of that two hundred. Mm -hmm. Equity. I call it equity in the attic. Yes, and right. it burned. Yes. <laughs> the property burns, and he ended up doing <clears throat> very well with the insurance. I did. Yes. Yeah. I did. Yeah. I owned it for a while, so you know the mortgage had been paid down. A good amount. Um, 
I had gotten a good, you know, the, the value was certain. Yeah, certain absolutely. There were the, the, yep, the rebuild value, which you didn't rebuild. I did not. In fact, I actually sold the plot of land to the church yes. that neighbored that property behind us. Um, okay, do you want to share what you did with that as well? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So... You guys will love this. So I sold the piece of land for, for X dollars, um, and then I turned around, basically a handshake agreement with the church, and I said that I would then turn around and donate uh, a chunk of it back for the tax deduction so that it ended up being a, a solid win on both sides. They got it cheaper, and I had far less capital gains to deal with, so, uh, so right. that, that worked out really well, and they now have a beautiful parking lot. They do. <laughs> you can get in and out of the church and you're not blocked on, on both sides. That's right. But yeah, but with, with the proceeds from that insurance payout, I, did, I purchased three more properties. Um, I think that was 11 units, or maybe 13. It might have been two floors. Were they the ones that we did with Larry? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so it was. It was a five and a four and a, and a three. So it was 12 units. It was 12, 12 units. units. So, 12 that's, so that's units. when I stepped in. So <clears> we were like, he had come to me, he couldn't get any more capital, he wanted to keep lending. We came up with this idea to, to borrow across four properties, which could be done with a private lender, and then the house burned so he didn't have to do that. So then we proceeded to, he would buy a property and he had down payment in the bank, but we would he would buy two on the same day and we would close them on the same day with the same down payment. And he would get the down payment elsewhere for one, do a joint venture and then use the money for the other one. And we grew him yeah. 11 doors. Yeah, yeah, 11 or 12. In like a nine month period. Yeah, that worked out really well and-, and I was... Until we got our hands slapped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you more than me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and I, I also, you know, so I used to be a high school teacher. I, I am not now as of five or six years ago. Uh, and the proceeds from that enabled me really to to leave uh, because I own the axe throwing company uh, in Halifax. I'm one in Fredericton, one in St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, and our first location in St. John's, Newfoundland was funded by some of the proceeds from that insurance payout. So that, uh, that initial rental property that I purchased with absolutely no idea of what I was ever doing quite literally changed my life in ways I can't even describe. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So so tell us now, so so yeah. I'm a broker, but I can only take people so far on their journey as well. And <clears throat> when we were doing your deals, there was a lot more ability for the number of uh, rentals that somebody could have and he could have four at this lender and four at this lender and four at this lender. And so we maxed him out, but then you had to sort of go over to the commercial side yep. as well as <clears throat> private lending. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I've done, um, you know, like you kind of said in, in my intro, I really have been, always been fascinated by the creative financing. I, I just think it's so fascinating. You know, it's a game, you know, if there's a will, there's a way. Um, and I, I just really wanted to go down that path uh, of figuring that out. And so the next few properties um, that, that I purchased all, and to this day, to be honest with you, um, have been creative in, in one way or another. I've done, you know, VTBs, uh, joint Vendor ventures, box, yeah. joint ventures in, in numerous different setups. Um, you know, partial ownerships, like payout at the end. Um, lots of different ways to uh, to get into it. Uh, and I'm just a little bit relentless with it. You know, I went, to, I I hounded my realtor. You know, to meet with the seller of, of a property here in Windsor, and he he eventually agreed to it uh, at a Starbucks in Halifax, and, and I basically I just convinced him to give me a vendor take back uh, for the property, and he was like, fine, whatever, <laughs> to take it. Uh, so it was great. So it's, you know, that's how I got the property, um, and since then, my my business partner and I um, have purchased a, a good number of properties, not so much in Nova Scotia, but in Newfoundland. Um, and everything that we've done there has been uh, private lending. So we will just buy buy a property, sometimes outright, depending on how much it costs with, with private money, um, which is pricey. Um, but as long as you have an exit plan, it's okay 
to do it. Uh, and you can kind of feel the pinch for, for you know, a few months, but we're very meticulous in, in the plan. And I think it's important to note as well, <coughs> is he's done a lot of this growing without having an income on paper. And by income on paper, I mean that when I was doing his mortgages, he had a nice, I'll call it a juicy salary as a school teacher that we were able to use to leverage his borrowing power as well as get him mortgages at <coughs> regular banks. When you don't work and your job is buying and flipping real estate, owning ax companies that got shut down during the pandemic, like most people would think that they were out of the game. Paul's never out of the game when it comes to that stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. My, yeah, my cousin and I, uh, who's my business partner, we, we often, you know, refer to ourselves as we're a little bit like cockroaches just because we probably should, <laughs> <laughs> we probably should have died during the pandemic, you know. Being, being I think a, that's a nuclear bomb that cockroaches uh, live in. Yeah. Being in the industry we were in, we were, we were both bar, restaurant, and entertainment, so, you know, the, the worst of, uh, the worst trifecta possible, but we just kept, you know, kept grinding, and, and in fact, we grew our real estate portfolio during those two years by, I think, four or five buildings, and, you know, X number of however many units it was, uh, kind of thing, so, you know, it's been, it was a great opportunity for us just to focus and, and figure out, well, what is possible during this time, and, and, uh, and private money was our friend, for sure. I, uh, and that's, I think, the, the key lesson that I want people to understand is that Paul was a school teacher who started a business, axe throwing, which was recreation, restaurant, that kind of thing, got shut down during the pandemic, which meant that his business, business wasn't generating revenue and he was still acquiring real estate yep. to grow and make money, right? That's huge. And you were buying, and to add on to that, because I, I know you presented here before one of the buildings that you bought, so you bought like for 75 and then you did some renovations and then you were able to refi it and that kind of thing. Yeah. So tell us about that. Yeah, that I mean that's sort of the the bread and butter. You know, I'm, I'm sure everyone you know in the real estate world is the the, the phrase burr is you know the most one of the pretty much the most common phrases now. Um, but that's you know just what we do. We just look for a you know a good deal, uh, buy it, you know ideally at a discounted rate. Sometimes that's hard, but you buy it at a good price. Um, know that the value is there uh, via an appraisal. Just you get an appraisal that's here's what we want to do. So you tell them, I want an appraisal for right now. As is. And then as complete. So as is versus as complete. And if the spread is what we want, uh, then we'll go for it. And if it's not, and you know, we spend <clears throat> six, seven hundred bucks on an appraisal, then that sucks. But and that, but that's, that's key though is. as well is because we do like I do have. People that are wanting to do this, but they don't want to go with that six or seven hundred dollars yeah. to see if it actually is going to work for them. Yeah. Right. Like I have a client right now. I know of a property in Halifax that she could get for three hundred thousand, but it's a hoarder, mm -hmm. and the house is going to have to be gutted, and there's a lot of things that are going to have to happen to it. But it's in an area really close to the Halifax Shopping Center. <laughs> right. That could be worth seven hundred when it's mm -hmm. finished. Like there's. There's a lot to consider, and then you also have to bite the bullet. So if she goes and buys that, getting a private lender to lend you 100% of the purchase price based on what you're gonna do to it, also give you the money mm -hmm. to fix it, like they're going all in with you, but borrowing the money versus partnering with them is way better, right? Yeah. Because if you borrow the money, you can pay them out and they're out of the deal. If you partner with them, you gotta pay them on the profit. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So we, you know, we like to just borrow it for a set period of time. Yeah. You know, it's 12 months, 24 months, whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, at the end, everybody's happy. They get their money. We got our property. Uh, you know, we try to create a situation where we're into it for zero dollars. That's sort of the best case or even get paid, which has happened a couple of times. Um, but even when we have to leave money in the deal, you know, you're getting such a discount on, on the property because A, um, you've renovated it, so you now have an up-to-date property. The CapEx that you need to worry about is, is much, much smaller. Um, you know, so there's a lot of positives in, in doing it that way. And if you have to leave, you know, 10 grand into the deal, then so be it. Very minor. <coughs> Very minor. Exactly. Um, okay, so I'd like to open the floor up 
for anybody that has questions that would like to fire. Scott! <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just speaking to what you were just, just uh, speaking about there, the paying, just going with private money, paying cash for a place. Do you, the, that spread you build into it, do you build in like it, this will take us three months, it's going to be vacant? Do you build that in as a, as just the cost of the money or do you build in some profit for yourself there as well? Like how does, how does that factor in? Like you, you make payments on it or do you yeah. just pay at the end? Yeah, yeah, there's actually different ways to do it. Um, usually where I get my money, there is a monthly interest payment, mm -hmm. um, and we factor that in, so we, yeah. we know right away. And sometimes we'll borrow enough to be able to make payments. Cover the payments. So yeah. we'll take an extra $7,500 just to be able to make payments because yeah. we know that the money's gonna be there at the end. Yeah. Um, the quickest we've ever got in and out was about six months. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It was about four and a half, five months was the quickest one. Um, but you know, everything always takes longer than you want it to. Um, so they tend to go a little bit, a little bit higher than that. The best, the easiest way to do it, obviously, is if you can acquire the property vacant and you can, you know, turn things over the way you want it to be. Not always the case, especially right now when there's a, a crunch in, in the rental market. We purchased a four unit property exactly a year ago now, um, and it was full, and we renovated, we've renovated all four units. So it was a slow churn, and the plan was three months, three months, three months, three months. And it almost worked to clockwork, with the exception of the one tenant just was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm out, I want to leave now, which was fine. Was good. So yeah, we're really fine with that. Yeah, <laughs> we were completely fine with it. Um, it it just needed love. It just it was run down. Um, you know, we didn't do anything major mechanically. Like the roof was sound, the windows were sound, electrical was completely updated. A lot of the good stuff. It just it needed. lipstick and mascara. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Flooring, paint, new appliances, just all that sort of that stuff. And then when the appraiser came through, it it appraised for seventy five thousand dollars higher than what. Um, we had hoped it would appraise for, so we got an as is and a, as complete a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but the lenders now they're like, no, we want an up to date one now. Which we're like, okay, fine. Um, so we had a different appraiser go through, and seventy five higher than, awesome. than what we wanted. And we're like, all right, we'll take the money, <laughs> get you out. Right. So, so yeah, you're just just refinancing it now, or yeah, we're literally right now. We're right. in the we're in the process. Uh, we borrowed. Um, we actually borrowed so. One piece that, that I didn't quite get to was, you know, I have people now that are just, they'll kind of like grab me once, once in a blue moon and be like, what are you doing with this real estate stuff? Um, you know, and I've had people that are interested in investing and, and so, you know, we've had some partnerships with family, friends, you know, and, and now acquaintances, um, which is kind of neat. Um, so we borrowed over six figures for that deal. Um, all, you know, with family, friends, acquaintances, uh, it's all going to be paid back. They've all gotten their monthly interest payment. Some of them wanted a lump sum at the sure. end, uh, kind of thing. And then there's, you know, a hefty amount left over that we're actually turning into. We have a, con a deal under contract right now, a nine unit property in, in New Brunswick. Okay. First New Brunswick property. Uh, so yeah, so we're just kind of Sherman. Is that Frederick version as well? At least near the axe store? Or? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's about 20 minutes outside of Frederick. Yeah. Yeah. We have coupons in every apartment. Yeah. <laughs> 10% off. Yeah. 10%, yeah. So I think, I, think it's also important, I think it's also important to note as well, Paul has done a lot of private lending, but when you build a rapport with a private lender as well, so Scott is a private lender. He lends money. Um, and it's important to note as well, so I, I just recently had... A person turn her house into two units and then uh, she now wants to put a suite in her backyard and she's right in Halifax and she can do that for $30,000 so when we did the first unit it was a private lend a peer-to-peer -peer lend mm -hmm. so now when I had that another lend for her I went back to the same lender and I was like oh this person is looking for money again but she's like I'll write you the check right now mm -hmm. so it's also I think building relationships with lenders, yeah. investors, and that kind of thing. And that's what this is meant to do. So if you talk to Ewan, who's come to a lot of our meetings or whatever, mm -hmm. he's built relationships, and that's what you've done as well. Yeah. And you can do that with your bank and your lender. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So I have a friend who's gone from, say, $100,000 of property to about $10 million of property, and he's going to $20 million this year. He's got $25,000 showing on his line 150 on his tax return. He has built a relationship with a specific lender in New Brunswick. Come on in, Dana. Uh, um, he's built a, um, a really good relationship, and that's also a key. Yeah. Right? His stuff is all through One Credit Union in Fredericton, right? That's what they do. They buy buildings, they rehab them, and then they, they rent them back out. But their, their portfolio is up to about $20 million. Wow. Kind of wild. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so and do we have any other questions? Well, you, you talk about private money. Do you do more private lending or private investors like if you're if you're getting investors do they become a part of the uh, the ownership or part of the profit making or do you mostly uh, uh, borrow money from them and pay them back the interest but they don't become a part of the business yeah set so that last piece they said will will take their money use right. it give them a, a really attractive interest rate um, and then so yeah, but you, they're, yeah, they're yeah. So I had a meeting with uh, Jason Conrad a couple of weeks ago with this private lending thing that I'm starting, and he he basically said that if you can leverage and not bring in a partner, if you mm -hmm. know what you're doing and you know where you're going and you know where you want to be, adding someone in is if Never you know really. where you're going. If not you think if you think that you're not doing, you know. You're just gonna play around or whatever, but if you know that you're you can build something really profitable, never add a partner. Always borrow leverage to get yourself to the next level. Last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I and I thought that was very prudent because yeah. I have had people say to me that they want a partner in this company, and I'm like, nope. <laughs> Sorry. Well, <laughs> right? You know, it, there's a lot of people that want to start up and they can't because they have to have somebody to, to help them with knowledge for one thing, but also financing. And if they if they can't get it from lending, if they don't have equity or uh, something to back it up, then they may have to go to partnership. But going to partnership uh, changes a lot. Yeah, um, I, I had a situation with a client who uh, was a dentist who didn't need a partner. Right. And he brought a partner on because you heard Paul talk about the fact that he was the working partner. The partner yeah, was a money partner. He was the yeah. working guy, which worked yeah. out really well. But this person uh, brought a partner on, so they're profit sharing. Mm -hmm. yep. The other person's the working partner, but they didn't need yeah. anybody. They needed a property manager. Right. Yeah. Somebody they could hire and fire. Right. Exactly. But instead, yeah. they had to pull the trigger and sell the whole thing. Because they weren't getting the, the partnership wasn't you get working a partnership well. Where yeah. One partner doing eighty percent of the work. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And if that's not ironed out, so when you can leverage versus bringing in a partner, you're further ahead, and you've become very good at figuring out when a partner, a JV, a VTB, he's relentless. Like he sat that guy down. I think he was eighty years old. He <laughs> like, literally true. like. He sat him down, he's like, this is good for you. Like, I'm gonna save you capital gains. You, you did the research, I'm gonna save you capital gains, all the things, yeah. but that's what you've always done. Yeah. Tell the story about <laughs> the donuts. <laughs> he bribe a donut. No, no, he actually, down payment is the biggest, down payment and income are the two biggest things right. and barriers for people yeah. to get into property. So down payment, he's like, I need more down payment, I need more money. So he went and bought a donut machine. Yeah, he did. What, yeah, donut yeah. machine. Yes. Yeah. One little mini donut making yeah. machine and, and went to fairs and festivals and jammed bags <laughs> full of five dollar bills and sold donuts. Yeah. Perfect. To make money for down payments. <laughs> now when when you first started doing things and now of course it's probably different, but you, you use the term attractive for investors. What do you consider attractive? Ooh. Like, what do you, what, yeah. what do you, how do you determine what's attractive to uh, have somebody give you some money? Great question. Uh, so, it certainly depends on the person. So, for example, you know, like my parents have have given. Me, my parents are obviously like I'm in my mid forties. My parents are older, so to them, attractive is you know like their money's safe right now. Like they're retired. Yeah, as long as they don't lose their yeah. Their so, money. so you know, like safe. So we gave them like six and a half percent or something on their money. Other people it's family. Been, you know, know. Other people it's been eight, eight and a half percent. Um, as high yeah. as oh, well we, and what that's about the highest that we've paid. And, and what type of term term of five usually three, four months? We usually go twelve to eighteen just because we'll, we'll sign a one year term 
uh, if we're using a, a bank, mm. we'll right, sign right, a right, one-year right. term, and that's about as quick as you can get in and out. If we have a private lender, then we can churn quicker. We can go six months if we want there. But if we have so a you're not lender, paying twelve percent with Marty. Uh, I will, uh, yes. if, if, if I need to, yeah. for sure. Uh, I had a long chat with them two days ago yeah. um, about, uh, about some funds for, for this New Brunswick deal. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if when people are offering and you know, expressing Oh yeah, interest. absolutely. So, so you've built, so Paul did use private lending 12, 14% yeah. probably seven or eight years ago. Yeah. But because he's been doing this for so long and he's been so successful at it, now now the money is coming to find him. Right. So now he's able to offer them decent return on their investment. Because uh, as you know, if you put your money in a mutual fund, well, hope and pray. Is that what they call it, Scott? Like put your money in, you hope and pray. Hope and pray that it's going to turn out, right? So he's at least able to give hope his parents and his investors more than what they would get at the bank, mm -hmm. secured with yeah. the property. Uh, as well as with a plan to exit them so that they can go invest in something else, right? <coughs> Correct, yeah. Well, and, we'll, and we'll show them yeah, the plan. Yeah, most importantly, we get involved that it's like, you know, there's three things to remember, is operator, operator, and operator. Yeah. He's, pretty, he's got a track record, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. know, people write checks because they know. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. They know they're getting it back. Yeah. That's the key. It's yeah. equity and exit. Exactly. Private lending is two things, equity and exit. And if you're willing to pay for the appraisal, yeah. to know that there's equity and you're also able to get the job to completion. So. Tell us about, so I know here in Nova Scotia, and I know in Newfoundland as well, you have specific people that do your jobs. Absolutely. Like you're not, he's not hiring mm -hmm. this plumber for this job or this guy for this job. Yeah. He's waiting for the guys that he knows that are basically part of your team. Yeah. They, you know, they're not, they're not employed by you, but they're who you use over and over again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, you know, our, our go-to we have our go-to people in, in Newfoundland. Newfoundland is where we've been the most active the past four or five years, um, and we've given we have a great relationship with a general contractor who has a team of, of the electricians, the plumbers, yep. the, the HVAC, yep. the, everything else, um, and we just call them like, hey, need a quote, need this, need that. We pay him. He sends us an invoice. He's paid that day. So he loves us, we love him, he treats us right, we treat him right, uh, and that's kind of the magic of, of being able to grow a little bit, I guess, is, is you know, those Well, you probably, you probably did that in the beginning as well. Maybe you were net 30 or net 45 in the beginning, <coughs> and now you're like immediate, yeah. but you also know the product you're getting, and they also know they're getting paid. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a win-win. Yeah. Contracts are always good when they're a win-win. 100%, and yeah. the more wins, the better. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions they want to ask? No? I really don't watch the yeah. video. <laughs> I'm so excited to watch the video. Okay. <laughs> I don't have a question either. Okay, so thank you. This was fabulous. Um, if you have any questions, we'll put Paul's information up. He's been doing this for a very long time. No two deals are the same. No two investors are the same. No two partnerships are the same. Right? You have a very good partnership with Adrian. And I'll never forget, I was ironing clothes in my hallway, and you told me about this axe throwing. And I was like, what? And I like, left my iron up on the table, and I'm, I got him in my earpiece, and I'm going down to my computer. I'm going, well, holy shit, they're doing really well at West. So they're making $4 million at this one place. And I was like, okay, all right. And, yeah. and they, they had no money at the time for it or whatever, but here they are with several ownerships. So it's got nothing to do with, you know, where you are, it's where you're going. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry, the table is like way yeah. off. Yeah. So that concludes our Annapolis Valley Investor Meetup. I uh, hope you got a lot of enjoyment from it. Probably need to be on camera or no, we're off. Yeah,